Okay. So uh, you can get access to rows by uh, asking for a component here. So for instance, we can ask R0 and this is going to be the first row, R1 the second, etc. And uh, one way to do it, to create this list dynamically, is to say, for instance, uh, allocate a list like I did before for an output. This is actually what you should not do, but let's uh, do it. And then you say, for instance, for i in range uh, len of r, you can access it this way, or you can say r dot shape zero. So this is the, 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 the size of the number, this is the number of rows. So if I say r dot shape, I get the array is shape 10, nine. And if I take zero, I get 10, right? So I can say for I in range array shape zero, I say out dot append R of I. So basically we are appending in the output uh, uh, rows of the matrix. And now the, our output is a list of rows, okay? This is what you should uh, event to. Uh, this could be your function, but uh, there is a much, much easier way to do it uh, by actually automatically creating a list. Uh, and if you say you list uh, the array, Python is already doing uh, the job for you and is listing the component of the array and just actually returning the same output. This is because array is iterable. So if for instance, I say, when I do a for loop on the array, I say for row in R, Basically, I name it row because actually I'm, I'm uh, going through the rows, okay? And so the array is iterable. So these are the rows, I can access the rows. And so I can just list it and get the same output, right? So the solution to the first one is to basically do list to return list of R. And uh, what is the solution of the second one? There was an int in the text uh, that uh, you may want to use the transpose because if you do array.t, you are actually transposing the array. We saw this doesn't create a copy of the array it's for free the transpose, uh, it's see the same data. So it's a good operation to do and uh, it's not bad. Uh, and it's going to basically change the order of the matrix and what were row become column and what were column become row. So basically the, uh, the second one can be easy, say get rows uh, of, uh, of r dot t. So this is, I'm actually using the same function I created before and just transposing the matrix, okay? So this was the solution to the first one. Okay, uh, any question? Then uh, there was an extra exercise. Uh, first, Simone, so you eat, um, um, does it recognize, uh, so for a row in uh, array, so doesn't, uh, I mean, the, wouldn't it go through the elements of the array? No, we'll go through the first axis. So when you try to iterate an array, the array is a, a, is a given shape, right? And so when you try to iterate it, you will go through the outer index. So this is a matrix. And if you try to go through the elements of the array, the first el the elements of the array are actually rows under this point. Okay. And then if you iterate the rows, you get the single values. Okay, mm -hmm. but they, it's jumping from a row to another when you try to iterate it in this way. And basically each row is just a view of the same ar array. So I'm not allocating memory here. Each of these, uh, if I ask, uh, uh, if I take a component, they're actually still pointing to the same array like I said before. Uh, so if I take the, the second and I say uh, array interface, uh, this is actually a slice. Uh, and so this guy, is pointing to the same, but doing uh, uh, by switching by point, but uh, starting from another point. Okay. Now, 
um, there was an extra year for getting raw vectors. So basically, the requirement now is to don't lose the fact that uh, it's a sh it's a matrix. Uh, and so, if you want to get rows, uh, here I was asking to get uh, uh, the rows as a shape one m. So the, the matrix is m times m. You want to get the shape as one m, and the other n one. Okay. How do we do this? Well, we do something similar, but what do we need to do? So now we want to have, uh, let's start from the first. We want to get something that has shape one M. So our array uh, now has shape uh, uh, NM are 10 and nine. If I want to get uh, list of uh, rows, I mean, if I want to get rows that are, uh, uh, that have the shape one M. Well, basically I could list it and reshape all of them. Or the other way around is to say, to change the shape of the array. So if I say colon comma none, right? If I say colon comma none, I added for free a new axis here. You see where I'm going? So if I say none, I'm adding for free a new axis. This is still the same array. And uh, the number of elements of the array is the product of the components. So I can for free add as many axes as I want uh, without uh, having to create a new array because these are still the same number of data, right? So if I say colon comma none, and now it's shape uh, 10, one, nine, uh, and if I list it, uh, right? Uh, if I list it, uh, now I get, uh, uh, rows of vectors of rows. You see, there are double parentheses. It's different from the previous uh, because now there is a shape one comma nine and not uh, nine comma one. So this is just uh, an exercise uh, that you, you can do. Try to do by your own uh, how to do the column vector. So you can use a similar way to do it in one line. So we will not do it, do it now, but you can try, you can try later to do column vector by your own, okay? Any question? Anyone that feels brave and want to tell me the solution of this uh, out of art? No? So let's, I'll let you think about it and we, we go, we go further. Okay, now I, Another important topic uh, that uh, I would like to cover is about what we already mentioned before are the vectorized functions. So, so far there should be this message, uh, should be clear this message that Pi to, uh, NumPy is doing everything uh, uh, on a, in a vectorized way. And uh, uh, it's, um, it's basically uh, just looping uh, in, uh, from com with compile code the functions, the array, sorry. And for this, it provides you a um, large number of functions uh, that are named universal functions. Uh, and these are basically element-wise operations. So they are acting on each element. Like we did now the sum of two arrays, for instance, those go element-wise uh, and they sum two arrays. If you ask the square root, uh, it's going to do the square root of every number inside the array. The same is true for the exponential, the cosinus. So these are named unary function because they take only one argument. Binary functions take two arguments. And then we have reductions. So reductions are functions that reduce the size. Basically, you go from a matrix to something that is has less dimensions, OK? Uh, OK, here I think, OK, they are just uh, I think it's quite understandable. So the, if I create, for instance, an array of uh, one, then I'm adding two. So this is an array of trees in this case. Then I'm adding three to one because I'm adding the two array together. I take the square root, I get two. So basically, this is just a set of operations that are acting element-wise and you're doing, you're getting the same result. Okay. And if I say sum, I can just uh, uh, ask to sum everything and obtain this. 
in the same way, like uh, you, you sum, you can ask for the product, the mean, and uh, you can, uh, it's plenty of function to use. And these uh, uh, are very user-friendly and understandable. So I would have also a slide on that. Uh, this is about item accessing, so leave it there. And these are universal function. Okay. Um, I think this was, uh, this should be fine. Uh, let's, before going here, yeah, let's talk about an issue of uh, NumPy though, on this point of view. So NumPy is fast. It does, uh, uh, it does all these operations uh, uh, in a vectorized format and very fast. But uh, when you use uh, NumPy, you actually you can never really reach uh, C performance. And the reason is this one. What is, for instance, the difference between uh, the left and right? So both of them are doing the same uh, calculation. They're doing x squared plus 2x plus 1. This is done with NumPy over the wall, right? The right-hand side is uh, a for loop that goes over the elements and does uh, uh, assign the value of y of the x squared plus 2x plus 1. Uh, but what is the difference between the two approaches? Sorry? The, mm, no. And it's, it's, they, they have the same number of floating point operations. That is the same because you do still the same calculations. Okay. What is the, the major issue that uh, it's differentiating the two ways of doing this. The point is that in a for loop, this set of operations are done per element. So you are directly doing this operation and assigning it. The other one does the operation per, uh, a, a literally as it's written. So first it does x to the power two, then it does two times x, then it sums them together, and then it sums one. So the difference on this left-hand side, uh, that is a, a performance drawback uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this way of doing calculations, uh, is that uh, you can, the uh, NumPy itself, it doesn't know really what you want to do. So NumPy will be asked to do an operation per time. So first it will be asked, okay, do me x squared. Okay, I do it, and I give you. Then. Uh, uh, you know that this operation needs to go in order. So I do first multiplication, I do two times x. Okay, I do it and I give you another array. So NumPy is creating an indeterminate two temporary array where it stops this operation. And then Python is asking, okay, now that you got this result, does do an, an addition, I sum them, I get a three. And then I hear the time a three, I sum one, I get two. So doing this uh, in Python, is required to do four for loops because I have to do one, two, three, four for loops on the data. I had to do five array access because I had to access X here, X here, A1, A2, A3 in order to do it. So I, I had I access five different array memory and I had to create three extra arrays in memory. So these created more, sp more space in memory for getting Y. Of course, all of this is trashed away, but uh, for arriving here to create these temporary arrays. On the right-hand side, nothing. C does simply access the array once, you get x1 here, x1 here, the compiler will be optimized for you, just gets it once, does multiplication, stores them, and you have the result. You don't have any extra memory allocated, you have only one array access, only one for loop. And this is something that you can never achieve with NumPy, okay? In NumPy, we will always be pedantic in doing all this operation. And this is something that costs, and costs more than what C will do. So you will never get exactly the C performance unless you do some more tricks like we are going to see with NumPy. But this is an issue of this uh, vectorized operation that go loop per loop. The same issue, for instance, you have it with C++ with any object of the entire language, unless you're very careful. So, it's still very fast, but uh, it's a performance drawback. So it's not as fast as C. It can be maybe 10% slower, 20% slower. It's 
are small numbers, but there is a difference. Okay. Uh, any question on this? So you need to be careful that any operation that you do counts in uh, on NumPy side. Okay. So if there are no questions, uh, I will go comment another very nice feature of NumPy that uh, is about uh, the axis. So another very feature, interesting feature of NumPy that allows you to do to increase the workload uh, is to use this multidimensionality of your system to basically do many operations in parallel and uh, uh, and then reduce them up to a point that, that is required. So suppose you have multiple set, uh, um, an array like this, uh, let's say an array of shape 10, 100, I could interpret it, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't print it, sorry. I could interpret it that, uh, as uh, uh, 10 times uh, 100 measurements of my data, of my experiment, right? So you can interpret the first index as uh, the multiplicity of your, of your experiment, of your data set, uh, and then this is actually the data size. The same can come true the, for uh, many other things. For instance, you, you have an image. Uh, an image, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can store it, for instance, you can store it with something that has a shape, uh, the, number of images, then you can have the X and Y that are the, uh, the size of the image, right? Then you can have, for instance, uh, three that is the, are the RGB values, and uh, you can have many other components and see this as a multidimensional array. So this allows you to create, to put inside one unique array, a lot of data. As far as the, the sizes of each column, is the same. So you have uh, all images, a requirement is, is that all images have the same size X and Y. If they are different size, you could then actually do this. So you can put everything together and then you can nicely do op operation axis wise. So if I'm here now, I created these 100 elements, something very interesting is that now I can store this in an array, okay? And uh, uh, this now is a this array with shape 10, 100. And for instance, I can ask, okay, I can say array.sum, and this will give me the sum of everything. But this is maybe not the most interesting thing you want to do because if these are 10 experiments, maybe you want to do the sum over the 100. So here you can say axis equal uh, one, and this will return you 10 numbers where the operation, the sum is done along the axis 100. And the same you can do in the opposite way and say axis zero. And so do the, the sum along uh, the zero axis and get 100 numbers as output. So um, this is a nice feature that uh, the axis allows you to, and here it's a bit more explained, you can read more about it. And basically you can, uh, it's very powerful to be able to do things axis wise because allows you to, uh, allows you to, uh, to store to make the arrays much bigger and then be able to do operations along certain axes. Okay, here there will be another exercise. Uh, just maybe think there are more interesting things to to have a look at. So I will uh, let you do it maybe later if we have some time. Uh, let's see how it goes now. So basically this exercise is about getting a set of matrices that is size N and M, and you want to compute uh, the angle between different vectors. So you consider this matrix, not actually as a matrix, but to be N vectors of size M. And you want to compute this quantity. So you would like to write this function that computes uh, the norms uh, uh, X square, Y square, and X and Y, like written here. So this, uh, it's an exercise that uh, you could try doing and uh, complete here. If there are no questions about this part, uh, axis and universal function, we move to another nice feature that is broadcasting. Uh, any question here? Okay, online? Okay. 
Then uh, let's see uh, two more things. One is broadcasting and then Lumba. And then uh, uh, I think we can do, uh, there's some discussion. So um, broadcasting. Broadcasting is another very, very nice feature of, uh, of NumPy that maybe it's easier to explain with some slides. And basically another uh, cool thing that NumPy does is to allow you to do operations between arrays that do not have the same size. And this, uh, uh, it's very useful for various reasons, and I'm going uh, to explain you some of them, but let's first understand how this works. So we said these operations that we said so far are element-wise operations, so you can only do them if the arrays have exactly the same size, and then these get matched component by component, and uh, component by component, the operation is done, and you get the result, right? So we are going over uh, each axis. Broadcasting, though, is, a, uh, is something that allows you to actually save memory and make your code much faster by avoiding to uh, repeat components in your array, but actually they letting NumPy there to deduce how these operations should be done. So for instance, you see here, here we have 0, 1, 2 repeated four times uh, because we want to sum basically these four numbers with these three numbers and get all the combination there. Yeah? A way to save, uh, to save, uh, to make it faster, according to memory, is to basically just say 0, 1, 2 with a shape 1, 3. And if I add it to something that has shape 4, 3, automatically NumPy will consider this as uh, the one as uh, a, an axis that can be extended. And uh, it will do, it will add 0, 1, 2 to the every row of uh, this matrix that is size 4, 3. Okay, so this uh, uh, it allows you this then broadcasting because it's basically broadcasting the same information overall. Okay, the same is true in the opposite way. So I do for one because indeed here I have the same information for every column. I used to do for one, and so NumPy can match the one and say since this is three, the output should have uh, size. Uh, four, one, and one, three. So I get, I combine them and this becomes four times three. And I do the same operation for every column and every one. Okay. So th this is very, very, very nice eh? and very useful. And uh, the rule is that NumPy match the, match the size from uh, right to left. So here I could actually have something of size three. They don't have to have the same shape, but you can have something of size three and will be matched right to left. Okay. That's the, the, the one. Piece of information. What about multiplication? Because that can be a big use. You know, it's the same. It's the same because uh, it's not a matrix. Uh, multiplication in NumPy uh, doesn't, mat uh, doesn't mean a matrix vector multiplication. Multiplication is always element wise. So, it, as it, what is happening for plus, it's happening for, for the multiplication. So, uh, multiplication, it's not the dot product, it's something else. I think that's why you mean it is ambiguous, right? Or uh, how is it ambiguous the multiplication? Uh, yes, for example, in the last example, in the last uh, line, if you had uh, the reverse order and you have multiplication, um, put, what is the reverse order? Uh, if you had um, one comma three multiplying four comma one. Okay, but uh, it, it's also the multiplication is also commuting. But let's say a difference. Uh, of course, but it's doing the operation uh, like this always. It's just filling up the matrix. The sign, what is in the middle doesn't matter. It's always a binary, binary operation. Okay, there is no ambiguity. It's always keeping the order and filling up. We, we are going to see examples now. Okay. So basically broadcasting is something very naive, eh? but also very powerful. So it's something like, uh, uh, what we did before, for instance, we are doing uh, R1 plus two. Doing this operation this is actually already broadcasting because doing plus two, for you it's intuitive. It's just adding uh, uh, two to the array, but it's kind of broadcasting. It's adding two to all components. It's one number, it's going to add it to all components, right? 
But in the same way, now I can define, for instance, these are rated zeros. And what is going to happen now if I add uh, this matrix of zero with the array of shape uh, zero, one, two? So if I do this operation, what do you expect? Zero, one, two again, or for every row, exactly. Because it's doing it operation one. Okay. And uh, if I wanted to do the opposite, I wanted to have zero, one, two, but per column now. What do you need to do? So you see the shape. The shape of uh, R1 and R2 is uh, so the shape of R1, R2 are. R2 is three by three, R1 is three. And I told you this is matched right to left. So because indeed you see that it's intuitive. I'm adding uh, these components for every row. If I want to add them for every column, what do I need to do? I need to reshape this one to make it of a shape one, uh, three, one. Okay, I can do it here. So I can use none to increase the shape. Now array three is a shape three, one. So it's uh, it's something that is looks like this. It's a colon now. And of course, it's again very intuitive. If I'm adding this column to this matrix, what do you get? You get three column that have uh, columns that have the same element. And this is very useful because if you want to scale some number element wise, uh, it's very fast to do it in much faster to do it in this way and uh, and uh, it's a, it's a very good feature. So if you want to, for instance, let's go back to the example I made you before. We have a, a, an image of this, of this kind. I want to scale all the colors. Well, I just multiply by three, three value and this is applied to all of them. I want to uh, scale uh, in some way the, the value per, per position along certain axis. I just put values along certain axis and this is going to change axis wise, uh, the content of this array. Okay. Yeah. I'm just thinking about this, this array that we just shape. Suppose we transport the, the, the array without doing the reshape. Is it going to give the same result? Good question. Uh, no, because uh, it doesn't know, you, it, will, it would uh, if the shape uh, that you give uh, it's, uh, different, let me explain better. So R1, we say a shape three. So if I transpose R1, the transposition of this still gives me something that has shape three. It doesn't, be, it doesn't add automatically a one because for NumPy, these are, are not matrices. So this, uh, uh, at the moment, it's still an array. And so it, reshaping, changing the order of axis gives you the same thing. To transpose something the same way, I need to make it first an array of vectors like we did before in the exercise. So if I add none now, now the none is shape uh, three one, which is still the same, uh, which is still the same. I just say now it's a vector, it's a, a vector row. So this now is the shape uh, is three one, uh, sorry, one three, one three, because I had the none at the beginning. And if now I do T, now it's changing the order and it's still one. So in this way, it does the same, but you need to first have the correct shape, okay? Okay. Other questions? Okay, so now let's do, you know that at school you learn the product table. So I want to learn what is the product of, uh, um, of uh, one number. So let's say I have a range. I have a range that goes 111. So this is something that has uh, uh, these some numbers that are like these. Okay. And I want to do the product table of uh, one times uh, one uh, times every other number up to 10. So I want to build up the, the cross product table between uh, one to 10. This thing is something you can do very easily now with NumPy. What should I do, basically? I have this X, 
right? And what do I need to multiply by? So if you want to do every cross uh, number. So if I do X times X, what do I get? Well, I get the product of itself. I just get uh, one, these are powers. It's not what really what I want to do. If now I do, for instance, X column non, eh? like this, eh? now I get uh, the, first, the first one is the row, the second one is the column, and basically now doing X times X none, eh? it did every cross product. Do you see it? Because uh, X column none, eh? is a vector now. So if I do this, the product of this one times this one, I get this matrix, right? So this is, for instance, something very easy to can achieve. And I don't know how many of you needs to do build up covariance matrix, for instance, but if you want to build a covariance matrix, so basically the covariance between one element and the other, uh, who knows what is a covariance matrix? Okay, how do you do a covariance matrix here now? So if I did to do a covariance matrix between, uh, basically the covariance matrix, something that is defined, I do X minus X min, okay? This would be the, the standard deviation. And I need to multiply it by uh, the X mi uh, minus X min for any other component. So I want to, um, the covariance is defined uh, between the covariance uh, of uh, x comma y is defined uh, as uh, the x uh, minus x min, uh, let's name it bar x uh, times y minus y min, right? So I want to do the um, I want to build up this covariance matrix. How do I do it? Any idea? The answer is the same, it's here. I want to do every cross product of every component. So this is how I do X minus X min, right? If I want to do every cross product, how do I do it? Well, I store this in Y, right? And then I want to do well, the same idea. This is going to give me the cross product between Y and itself and any other component. So this is going to be a covariance matrix. Sorry, just to make sure I get what this uh, non does, does uh, it just adds an extra uh, dimension? Ah, uh, the non, yes, it just adds an extra dimension. So basically it makes, uh, what was a row, a column. It's very useful instead of reshaping. Is you achieve the same goal as saying uh, uh, dot uh, reshape, but then you need to need the size. Uh, or you need to know the size, or if they say, because here it would be 10 comma one, this would be the same goal, the same result, but uh, you need to know the size or you want to use a minus one, but you need to call reshape. Instead, I can just say colon none, eh? and I'm adding uh, an additional dimension that is uh, this one. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so this is very powerful because I did uh, automatically without creating a matrix of the cross product, right? You understand? Any question? Okay, so broadcasting, it's uh, uh, a very uh, key feature also of NumPy that uh, I don't think many other languages do, or better, it was introduced here and then uh, many other places being used as well. Okay, so, so far, uh, I have stressed a lot uh, the fact that uh, you should always uh, use uh, uh, NumPy uh, for doing this kind of operation. And this becomes very easy as far as you need to do element-wise operation, okay? 
But if, what if your problem is more complicated? So I don't know, you I need to do, uh, you, you have machine learning and you need to do a convolution or uh, you just need to do some other different operation like uh, the difference uh, between uh, two next, uh, two neighboring components. So for instance, uh, you want to compute numerically a derivative. How do you compute numerically a derivative of a function? How do, I, how do you compute numerical derivative of a function? So let's say I have, uh, I want to do some function. Let's say I have an MP dot lean space uh, between, uh, this is going to create a continuous space between uh, zero and let's say two, do, two times uh, MP dot P pi. This is my X. Right, so this is a continuous space. And on this X, I compute Y as the sign of X. Okay, this is what, uh, sorry, P dot sign. Now, what do, if uh, I want to plot it, what do I do? I can use, uh, where well, before we see with, with pandas, you can say import, uh, you can say from math plot dib import by plot plt, and then you can say plt dot plot x comma y. And here basically we have a sign, okay? I want to compute its derivative. How do I do it numerically? What is the definition of derivative? Mm -hmm. Finite difference, perfect. So you want to do the difference of uh, one component and the next, uh, and that's your delta h and, com and compute it uh, and compute the derivative, right? How do you do this with, with uh, NumPy? So how can I do it with NumPy? Basically, I have y, right? Why are my y values? And I need to basically do the difference between this and the next one. How can I do it with NumPy? I cannot do y minus y because this is zero and, and not uh, shifting it. I mean, uh, that's the key, you, you need to shift them. So you, how can I say NumPy that I want to do an operation when I shift? Anybody knows? I told you it's very good in element one, but these are things that uh, you need always to, uh, you need to kind of find a way how to do it, okay? I believe you can do anything with NumPy just you need to learn more about the tools that gives you to do that. So for instance, I want to do the difference between one and the next. Basically, I would like to do the difference between the component one and the component zero, right? This is what I would like to do. And repeat it for every i. Of course, one way is to go is to do, uh, to do it with a for loop, but as I already told, it's a no go. But let's do it, let's do it as a for loop. How will you do it? So you say you can say uh, n is the size of the array. Uh, out is going to be zero like the array, just to create an empty output. And then I assign to every component of the output the diff y plus one minus y of i. Okay. So here I'm doing a for loop and I'm assigning one plus one minus y of i. Why do I have uh, the percentage n? What does it mean, this? <laughs> I like the faces. So the percentage n, it's a module because uh, uh, if I arrive at the end of the array, so these are 50 elements, uh, I can go up to 49, right? I can ask what is the element of 49. Uh, but if I ask the value of 50, what do I get? I get an error, will tell me, there is no element number 50. But uh, in order to do the difference for all values, either I iterate up to n minus, minus one, that's possible, or uh, I just want to start from the beginning, uh, n50 to be equal zero. If I do percentage n, uh, n is the size, so 50 percentage 50 does zero. The percentage operation is named module. So this tells me the, uh, you know, the, the module operation is uh, how much is left uh, out of the number. So 49 percentage 50 is 49. And this is true from zero to 50 to 49, and then you start back again. This is a module, your, your module. 
So this is how you will do it. And then this is my output. And then I plot it. I say, I say PLT plot X come out. And now what do we get? We got a cosine. So this was a sine. Now we got a cosine. Okay, ignore the last one because, okay, we are going to the boundary. Um, okay, any question here? So we had to use uh, Is this a good way? This is what I tried to tell you to not to do and I'm ending up in doing it. So this is not the correct way. I told you NumPy gives you all the tools for doing this. What is the tool that NumPy gives you to do the operation between two arrays? Well, this is named for instance, roll. So uh, now I have my Y or let's, sorry, let's start, uh, let's uh, name now R. So we have 10 numbers. Uh, the function that NumPy gives you is the roll function. Roll is going to do what it says. It's going to roll every element backward or forward of a number. So if I roll the array of minus one, now everything got rolled backwards and I got the zero there and everything came back, came back, came back here. If I do plus one, I can do it, uh, uh, I can do it forward. I had a multidimensional matrix, so let's do this uh, shape as uh, uh, five comma two. So for instance, I want to do it as along certain axis. I can simply say R roll of one comma axis equals zero. And now all the array is rolled along axis zero, like this. So you see that axis is very powerful. We are rolling only according to certain axis. And for instance, this is a very another important NumPy operation that you should know. It allows you to move uh, things around. And let's go back now to our problem. We want to do the difference, the final difference between two elements. So what do we need to do? Uh, sorry, I, I missed. Did the, does the roll operation give you the same size or? It... Yeah, it's the same size. It is a kind of periodic boundary condition. So. Okay, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. So what do we need to do for doing the final difference? We want to do this operation. So what do we need to do? Yeah. Exactly. We need to roll the first one and subtract the non-rolled version of it. This is how to do the final difference. So you do np dot roll r minus r1. This is the difference. And if now I give, let's call it again of y. Now it's going to do the same as I did before. And if I plot it, I keep obtaining the same. Okay. Any question here? So NumPy gives you- Was it a, the role of plus one? And it's minus one actually in this case, because you want, uh, uh, it's always confusing also for me, but if I say, we had it before this example. Um, now we, I want to shift it. Uh, it's always good to try it first at all and, under, and see that it does what you want. So now at the number zero to, to nine, if I want to shift, take the next component, I want to have basically the one at the beginning. And you see that if I roll up plus one, actually it's pushing forward, not pulling. So it's kind of, Counterintuitive, but uh, the plus is pushing, uh, the minus is pulling. Uh, so what we want to do is minus one because we want to pull everything back. Okay. So right. thanks. We can do the difference. Yeah. Okay. So this was uh, another example, but it's always good to search on uh, Google, etc how to do stuff in NumPy because you can basically do, do everything uh, and you should never end up doing things in Python, okay? The, because there is a difference in performance. It's huge. So never do for loops and data. It's not needed, okay? Okay, final point of this presentation. 
that uh, just it's a good knowledge. What if you don't have an, any other way than writing a for loop? What is your, uh, how can you do it? Do you need to end up to Python? The answer is ni. What you, your solution is Numba. Numba is this other package that is basically a just-in-time compiler for Python and uh, compiles Python code and produces code that performs uh, as fast as machine code. Just-in-time means that it does it, uh, you don't have to do anything over, uh, overhead, but it's uh, ahead of time, but it's done uh, just in time at the moment you want to execute. It's very, very simple to use it. We are going to see it now as an example. And uh, uh, it produces C performance. Why did I say that the answer was me? Because uh, the issue you have with Numba is that you need to write Python code. So to do actually what I told you to don't do so far, you write your function, but then you ask Numba to GT Python, and Numba will compile this thing with a C, to translate this in C code and compile it. But uh, for this reason, it's very powerful, just you need to write uh, explicitly the for loop. So you need to know, like I did before, uh, how to write, for instance, uh, your operation in a for loop manner, okay? So what, uh, let's, try, let's do it now, and we can see again this example. So we saw, this is how I was writing the for loop in Python. The same code I take it, put it in a function, like I do here, okay? And I say to Numba, and I decorate it with this decorator that is ngit, that is the Numba JIT, and uh, this one is going to be compiled. In the same way, I can produce parallel code by just saying uh, this function should be parallel, uh, should be run in parallel, and instead of a simple range, I put a P range, and this is going to do what I mentioned uh, this morning, uh, a parallel loop over the data. You need to be careful about this because the data uh, you need to be careful about what is known as race condition. You will see more with Yannis. But uh, um, because if you multiple thread try to write the same piece of data, you run into problems because uh, the, everybody trying to do the same thing. But here, this is a simple loop that you can parallelize. And so you can just do this thing. So you write the loop in Python. Numba, it's very simple. You say just to GT file and we will compile it for you. You don't have to do anything else. Okay, now let's uh, have a look at uh, the various differences. So final look about performance. Um, so let's first take the, the standard code. Let me create also a function for this. So basically it's the non, I copy this one without the JIT and I name it py. So uh, now we are going to have four functions uh, where uh, basically we want to time them. Let's for now run slower and let's time the difference done in, uh, in um, with the, the first one is NumPy, the second one is Python, the third one is Numba, and the fourth one is Numba parallel, like I did here. So we can run it, time it, and get the plot that we were getting at the beginning, where we see the cost. Um, just a second. The difference in Python shouldn't be that fast. Uh, maybe something about it. Um, anyway, this is weird at the moment. Um, I must have something wrong with this, but okay. Basically what uh, uh, we're going to see now, let's just put this one because the Python should be much slower. Okay, here I have the, uh, the three functions that I'm running. Let's run them up to 20. 
And basically what you can see is that uh, uh, the, that Numba produced code that is faster, also faster than, uh, than what is done by, by, um, by NumPy. So this was the function de defining NumPy, taking the difference of rolling something and separating the array. Uh, NumPy here, you can see that uh, this is the NumPy. NumPy is faster than that one in both cases for the non-parallel parallel version. And uh, uh, it's faster for few data as well as more. But to see better the more, I don't have to use a log scale. Uh, you can Sorry, what's what's the difference between the difference numba and the difference numba parallel? Yeah, I'm uh, going there in a second. So um, these, uh, um, so yeah, numba is is faster. You can see here than the numpy, a bit faster, but because it just is doing some more optimization. But anyway, produce code that is as fast, if not faster than uh, than uh, NumPy by taking Python code. So it does a very good job. It's, uh, uh, this is non-trivial. So it takes your code here, compiles it, uh, and uh, then you can run it without worrying to be to lose performance, okay? Uh, here I'm showing uh, two different plots. Uh, the one with uh, uh, the case where I use uh, NumPy, the pure one, the Numba version that is the plain one, this one on top, and then a parallel version where I'm running over this range in parallel, okay? What you can notice is something that maybe you wouldn't expect, that the parallel version is actually slower than the, the non-parallel version. This is true here online. If you run it on your local machine, it's actually faster. And the reason why it's slower is because uh, uh, Google Collaboratory just give, give us one core, one thread. And if you try to do multi-threading, Google Collaboratory actually runs slower than one thread. That's the only reason why here is, uh, that is why you see it faster. Uh, but the, this parallel version is basically uh, going to run the, with multi-threading, the loop over many components. Okay, that's the, the advantage of the parallel version. So it doesn't cost much to make it parallel, just say parallel equal to, you give a key range, and then you want to test if it's uh, performs better than in parallel, okay? But this will make you run in parallel. The first one, it's always uh, working well out. And, uh, cool. So concluding, if you don't have any other way around, you can still write your code in Python and very easily pass to compile. So this is something uh, that uh, you should uh, very try out. Okay, so this was the material. Uh, now it will be good to have uh, some questions and uh, also kind of discussion. We see a bit now in the, the just five minutes left. So let me conclude. So the message of this part is that if you're going to use Python, uh, please have in mind to never do for loop on data, always try to find another way. If your code runs slow, it's because of this, and you should never do it. There are plenty of ways to avoid it, and we saw a few of them. So either use NumPy or Numba. And uh, yes, in Python, even if it's uh, not meant for performance, you can reach high performance by uh, using some of these tricks. Okay. Uh, questions? Uh, may I ask something general? Yeah. Um, if we combine, if we compare Numba to a C program, will it still be slower or would it be the same? Yeah, how would it be? That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, Numba is always going to be faster than NumPy, and uh, it should uh, reach a level of performance as a C program because it's actually getting compiled, so parts are getting optimized. Having in mind what I said at the beginning, that all of these, the, the statement about being faster or not than a C code, old, or at least fa as fast as a C code, old in the region where you go, uh, your calculation costs more than the overheads of Python. 
a C code in this region will always run faster. Mm -hmm. uh, also that there are some overheads, but uh, as far as you, you go to a region where it's, uh, uh, you go to a region that uh, uh, you, you see the scaling of your code, then uh, I wouldn't worry about performance at the point because it's going to be as fast as C, okay? Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, the, the major issue of Python codes is that uh, often you may introduce too many overrides that you need to try to optimize. So many packages uh, often uh, compile part of the codes. Uh, the, but indeed, if you rely on packages, you always get a very good performance. So uh, that's uh, one of the jobs of the packages and that's why it's good to know what is available around to avoid to kind of reinvent the wheel of file to do, okay? But yeah, it can be very fast. I mean, it can be as fast as C. Other questions? Okay, I'm just thinking about a technical question that uh, I'm using Jupyter Notebook. So is it possible to work with NumPy in Jupyter Notebook or just only Colab? Uh, you can always use it uh, uh, like any other package. You import it and use it in Jupyter. Uh, there is no disadvantage on doing that. And um, I don't see reason why you should not do it. It's, it's fine, you can just write uh, in a Jupyter node, you can ask to compile it and the same. Okay. I mean, the only disadvantage of Numba, but it's not really a disadvantage. It's like I said, it's a just-in-time compiler. So you need to be careful that uh, there is an extra cost. The first time you do an, you call the function, there is an extra cost. And we saw it the first time this is run. So let me uh, reinitialize the functions. The first time you run the, the function, it actually runs slower, much slower than the rest. Uh, I'm going to, um, let's see if it appears here. Because uh, the first time you call it, it's compiling. So that takes time. You see this, these big peaks here. This is not because uh, it runs slower, it's a fluctuation. This is the fact that the first time you used it here, it compiled. But then it cached the compilation and you always use it. So what you need to be careful with Numba, the only thing you need to be careful is that the function needs to be defined outside and never inside a function. So if I get a, if I write a function that determines the function, the compiled function, suppose for instance, this every time it's a new object and gets compiled again. So it's good to know to have it the same object. That's, that's, that's a mistake you need to have in mind. But once it's compiled the first time, it's uh, it runs as fast as the rest. Okay, so you see, I took a, a one second to compile. It's a lot. But if you reuse it, then it's fast. Okay. Okay. Any other question? Okay. So then uh, we arrived, uh, we finished on time. And uh, I thank you all for the attention and uh, I enjoy, I, I wish you a good training day. Okay. Talk to you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simone, <laughs> for your presentations. <laughs> okay, so we have a short break now and we carry on with some uh, hands-on experience and uh, training in 15 minutes. Thanks again, Simone.